Hello and welcome to The Arise interview. 60 minutes of big questions about the big stories from the news and beyond with fresh insight and critical analysis. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Coming up in the next hour, they're about to turn it on again. Well, one of the biggest rock bands of the 70s, 80s and 90s and now the phenomenal British band Genesis have announced they're reuniting for their first tour in 13 years. But do they still have that invisible touch? We'll speak to a London-based journalist who's followed the career of the band for many years and to an international record producer who has remastered for some of the biggest prog rock bands ever in a moment. And so the drummer Phil Collins, the guitarist Mike Rutherford and the keyboardist Tony Banks, collectively known as Genesis, will take to the stage across the UK in November. They began as a progressive rock band, but transformed into one of the most successful mainstream groups, recording 15 studio and six live albums and selling more than 100 million records. The band last played together in 2007 to mark the 40th anniversary of their formation. Phil Collins, of course, went on to pursue a successful solo career. He's been suffering recently from ill health. So for this tour, the drumming will be performed by his 18-year-old son, Nicholas. We'll talk about all that in a moment. But first, here's a song that's considered one of their greatest masterpieces and it went straight into the global top charts, of course, Land of Confusion. Good day, two shoes. Betty by Bo's time again. Good night, honey. Sweet dreams, dear.
absolutely brilliant music there. Land of Confusion. Well, for more on the phenomenal British rock band Genesis, I'm joined now from our London studios by the international record producer Robert Corich, who has remastered for some of the biggest prog rock bands ever, and by the London-based journalist Paul Davis, who has followed the career of Genesis through the years, and who writes for Record Collector and Prog Magazine, as well as the Daily Express, the Sunday Express, the Times and the Independent. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And uh, I'll start with you, Robert. Um, it's taken a while though, hasn't it? I mean, you know, for them to get back together and do this again. It has indeed, Charles. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to be as good as I want it to be, but three is better than none, I guess. I'm looking at the, uh, the photo that's sitting between you and Paul there, and they've got the original lineup, or at least um, Peter Gabriel is there with them, and you, you've got sort of, um, you know, Tony Banks and Mike Rutherford, Phil Collins. Um, why now, though, Paul? I mean, I heard Mike Rutherford saying that it seemed a sort of natural moment because they're all still alive um, and above grass, as he said. Um, that, that's a good enough reason, isn't it? <laughs> well, the, uh, the reason is obviously uh, following on from Phil Collins's excellent performances as a solo artist sitting down, um, as he is since his operation and the uh, repercussions of that, he, can, he performed wonderfully well in his solo band and obviously Banks and Rutherford have observed that and in particular is um, son Nicholas on drums, who's a chip off the old block and um, they've obviously thought, you know what, I think we can get this and do it ourselves again. So they've obviously set up their first shows in 13 years, the first one being at Dublin on the 16th of November. Um, I would have thought, you know, they've, they've got all the confidence they have with Phil Collins now um, to not be as energetic, obviously, as he was once. It was a great performer live, you know, whatever body, you know, thinks um, about Phil Collins. You know, he was a magnificent performer, magnificent frontman, great singer as well. So they obviously can do that, you know, from his chair. So I would have thought that's the reason why, really. And just judging by how the tickets have sold, they've just flown out the window. And they're very expensive tickets as well. So there's obviously demand for this. So they've added another six dates um, towards the end of November and December. Well, I, I suppose for me, um, who is, of course, a big fan, and, and there are millions of fans sort of worldwide, it really doesn't matter what the reason is, does it? I mean, what is important is that they're actually turning it on again. And I'll put that question to Robert there. Yeah, I guess it's, it's good they're coming together. I mean, I would have preferred to have seen Steve Hackett and Peter Gabriel back in there in some form or another. Um, and you never know what rabbits might come, to, might come out of the hat before that time. Um, but yeah, it's good, good on them for doing it, even if it's not my favourite brand of Genesis. <laughs> I like that. I, I suppose you, you belong to that group of people, to some extent like myself, I suppose, who prefer the, the, um, the, the sort of the classical songs when Peter Gra Gabriel was part of it, Steve Hackett, all those great albums. I mean, we'll get to talk about that uh, later on, but I mean, are you, uh, Robert, a big fan of Genesis? I mean, I know you love prog rock. I know you've worked on a lot of the great albums um, that are produced or have been produced by prog rockers. Um, you know, but, but where are you, I mean, as a Genesis fan, are you sort of you know the, the the I mean I can I can guess that you you belong to the other sort of side of the of the Genesis you know the older sort of Genesis generation I suppose. Oh, look, Charles, I appreciate it all for music, um, and no one can take away the fact that the later Genesis they made poppier songs and they made a lot more money than the earlier Genesis ever did. So you know my hats off to them for that. Musically, the personally I prefer the earlier um, material. Um, right up to the point when Hackett left. I mean, interestingly, it was when Peter Gabriel left, the next two albums kind of followed in the same vein, and they were extremely brilliant albums, actually. But when Steve Hackett left, for me, that was the beginning of the end. And I think there's probably a lot of old-school musical people like me that probably feel the same. 
um, and the irony is, I think the best album they did after then there were three, in actual, in actual fact, was Calling All Stations, which went back to a more proggy idea. But that didn't sell, so they didn't take that one further. <laughs> Well, I mean, let me bring you in, Paul, because I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not entirely sure that I agree with uh, Robert there that, you know, the departure of Steve Hackett was the beginning of the end. Um, but, I mean, I don't suppose you're a journalist. You keep across developments, even those that are in the public and those that are sort of behind the scenes. Uh, is there the remotest chance that we're ever going to see that amazing original lineup that included Peter Gabriel and uh, Steve Hackett, or is that rather pushing it, do you think? Well, the interesting irony with these dates that have been set up in November, December, is that it coincides with um, a UK tour that Steve Hackett had already announced. In fact, he's touring the, his last album he was actually involved with, with the band, which was Seconds Out. It was a live album, double live album, uh, a seminal double live album at that too. And he's been touring um, Genesis material during his time in the band for a considerable amount of years now, obviously with the blessing of all parties and have been very highly successful worldwide tours. So the possibility there may be an overlap there or a night off where we might get invited back in, they, that could be a rabbit out of the hat that Robert um, earlier mentioned. I doubt there'll be Peter Gabriel would be involved. I mean, don't forget, in 2005, they all got back together, you know, to, um, you know, essentially for a DVD in 2005, and there was a lot of talk between the five of them actually going out on tour together, touring The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, which had an anniversary at that time. And that didn't really come to fruition. I mean, the four of them, including Steve Hackett, were in agreement, but Peter Gabriel was quite remote and distant and unsure and cautious, as is his want, you know, over you know, uh, the years. And that fell through, and I don't see the five of them getting back together again as such. Uh, I can certainly see if there, uh, you know, Steve Hackett possibly, possibly, there may be a remote chance that he might pop up for an encore, but who knows? I mean, that, that's a very, you know, dubious, you know, um, uh, prospect in itself, really. But look, Genesis fans are going to have a fabulous November, December with both parties, both touring at the same time. You've got the classic 70s, Genesis touring with Peter, uh, with uh, Steve um, Hackett, which is going to be an unbelievable tour. Steve Hackett just puts this music together supremely well. And you've got the 80s, 90s version of uh, Genesis okay. touring at the same time. So, you right, know, okay. um, well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you, uh, Paul, but uh, I've got to take a break. You're watching The Arise interview, plenty more still ahead, as we continue our chat about the reunion of Genesis, one of the world's top rock bands. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise Interview. I'm Charles Anya Golden. Now, one of Britain's and the world's biggest bands, Genesis, is getting back together 13 years after the last time they played live. Phil Collins, Mike Rutherford and Tony Banks have announced that they'll be loading up their bus and going on an international tour starting this November. And Phil's son, Nick, who recently accompanied Phil on a solo tour, will be on drums. This new Genesis reunion, which has been dubbed The Last Domino, is set to cover 10 days across the UK and Ireland. So why, after 13 years of silence, have Genesis decided to return to the stage? We'll attempt to answer that question in a hot second. But first, here's a reminder of why Genesis have become a global pop rock phenomenon. This smash hit single about an unscrupulous television uh, tele televangelist who lives like a millionaire thanks to donations from his followers is called Jesus, He Loves Me. Get 
Genesis there, and with me from our London studios, the international record producer Robert Corridge, who has remastered some of the uh, some some of the biggest prog rock bands ever, and the London-based journalist Paul Davis, who has followed the career of Genesis through the years, and who writes for Record Collector, the Prog Magazine, as well as the Daily Express, the Sunday Express, the Times, and the Independent. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for staying with us, and. Um, I'll start with you, Paul, because we interrupted you sadly before we went on break. Um, do we know what ails Phil Collins? I mean, we understand he's had a run of ill health and his son Nicholas is going to be doing most of the drumming on this tour. Well, you know, I mean, these, the, like I say earlier, there's the first show since 2007, but, you know, um, Steve Hackett is playing a U UK tour at the same time as Genesis are, you know, which is going to give, you know, like a bounteous, you know, choice for fans. Whether or not he will uh, be invited to appear with Genesis as an, an, an encore or not is um, another thing, you know, but there will certainly be a lot of uh, Genesis activity at the end of this year. And I rather suspect, you know, with the extra dates being added on, that the European um, market, there will there'll, there'll be a European tour maybe, and a, uh, a world tour announced on the back of this, just depending on how everybody performs together live on stage as a band after 13 years. But they've got plenty of time now, haven't they, to rehearse, and um, hopefully put in some of those old numbers that we all love, as old Genesis fans in particular love, um, which, you know, would be a nice, you know, um, Thing to do for everybody, but we wait and see what the set list will be on that. Try and ask you the same because I don't think Phil actually heard my question there, which is not his fault. It's our technical, um, you know, we, we have a technical hitch there. But I don't know if you can hear me, Robert. Nod vigorously if you can. Right, okay. Well, let me ask you that same question. Do we know what ails Phil Collins because he's had a run of ill health and his son Nicholas is stepping into the breach to, to be the drummer during this tour? Do you know what, what he's, what, why, you know, what, what ails him at the moment? No, I don't. I mean, I can imagine that it's partly to do with, you know, getting older. I mean, playing the drums is not an easy task for an older man. Um, so I'd assume that's a big part of it. But as to the medical conditions he's had, I haven't followed that. Well, the medical we conditions were talking he's about had, he this had a, um, um, operation on his back. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. You were saying something. Yes, operation on his back. An operation on his back. I can imagine. Well, and, okay. um, which has left him with um, substantial nerve damage. And he's got a, a, a medical condition called drop foot, which he needs to use a uh, walking stick for. Right. Also, he can't grip um, drumsticks as part of the nerve um, condition he's, he's found himself um, now experiencing. So 18-year-old Nicholas has stepped in. And um, as I said earlier, when he was on the solo tour, Phil Collins, his son was superb playing. Well, I mean, I would imagine he's a chip off the old block. I think you mentioned that the last time. Um, but, I mean, what does that mean, though, in terms of the kind of music we can expect in this tour? I mean, Robert, you were talking earlier about the fact that you prefer the music from the sort of the, the early years. Uh, I mean, I, I love that music, I have to be honest, but I also like the more recent 
you know, the more, the sort of the later stuff, um, you know, Land of Confusion, Jesus, He Loves Me, uh, all of that. Um, but at the same time, you know, you've got those great, fabulous songs from the 70s and early 80s. Um, and, you know, they, that also hits a, sort of a, the right mark. I mean, do you reckon it'll be a different band performing this time? I mean, dare we hope that we'll hear you know, things like nursery crimes and wind and withering and then there were three selling England by the pound, all those classics from those days? Well, we, we may do, Charles, but the fact of the matter is Steve Hackett's been out doing this for years and doing it absolutely brilliantly. So for the people who like the old music, I really don't think they're going to mind either way. Um, you know, this is two, two different bands here. You have Steve Hackett doing the old traditional long long songs that Genesis was so famous for and the things that made them become really the iconic prog band that they they were in the day whereas later Genesis was the pop songs and and that's good I mean it's good for for what they were doing not personally my favorite type of stuff but you know will I enjoy it going and seeing them of course I will um, but to me it's Genesis the three versus Genesis the real but that's just I like that. And I mean, you, you, we're going to talk a little bit about both your sort of careers a bit later in the program. But let me ask you this, Robert. Did you, I mean, you've remastered some of the greatest bands ever, really, prog rock bands for people who are interested in that kind of music. And I am certainly a big fan. I mean, did you ever do any work with Genesis? Never. Um, I would have loved to. I would have loved to have got my hands onto the master tapes of things like The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway and Selling them by the Pound and, you know, tried to have done something with those. However, um, if you have heard the, the, the 2007 releases which were done in 5.1, they are absolutely stunning. So maybe they can't be bettered. So some of these things are, although I'd like to have the, the ability to, to play around with it and toy with it, I doubt I could do any better than have been done to be frank and just uh, you mentioned uh, again selling england by the pound there it just kind of you know one of my favorite songs from that would have to be dance with the moonlit night which is just a phenomenal song but let me bring uh, paul in and paul you're nodding vigorously so i presume that you're also a big fan of selling of that particular album sort of selling england by the pound can you hear me paul at all Yes, just about Charles. Yes, a bit distant, but I'm, okay. I'm well, in, I'm going to try. I, I have to try and modulate my voice because if I yell, I'll blow the microphone apart. But um, I understand this tour, Paul, is called the Last Domino. Do we know why they've called it that? Yes. I mean, it sounds almost ominous, like it's the last shout. <laughs> the last hurrah. Well, there's a question mark after that, isn't it? And I think that question mark speaks volumes. Um, what it actually says is um, we're going to see, give this a go and see how well it does. Well, ticket sales have gone very well, so let's see how well they perform. And if it goes really well, then the last dom domino question mark could go on for another year or two, couldn't it, on a worldwide tour? Of, of course, domino was... Um, a well-known song on, um, I believe it was Invis Invisible Touch album, and um, you know, so they've taken that um, as a musical reference to some of their, you know, much more recent, um, as it were, um, the three of them together, their their recordings. Um, whether or not that domino will fall over, as in the logo, and not get back up again, or just stay the way it is, wobbling, we don't know, do we? However, I do suspect that this is just a foretaste of going onto a world tour. Whether or not there'll be any new music, we don't know, do we? Because Mike, obviously, uh, Rutherford has put the mechanics on hold. Um, Tony Banks is obviously, you know, put all his recording on hold. And I would have thought Phil Collins too. So three people who've got creative, you know, juices um, flowing, coming back together, rehearsing, you know, for gigs and sound checking. There's going to be ideas thrown around there, isn't there? I would have thought what those ideas may be, what they may become or not become, will be of interest. But um, they could possibly end up being certainly a live album out of this, and maybe studio material further on down the line as they feel their way through this tour.
And uh, Paul, you, you mentioned earlier, or I think Robert did, that the tickets, um, obviously for the last Domino Tour, have gone on sale. Um, I think they went on sale at 9 o'clock GMT on Friday, the 6th of March. Did you get a ticket? We've got about 20 seconds. <laughs> uh, not as yet, no, I haven't, because um, you can try and get a ticket, but um, they just sold out so fast. You go online and before you put one in your basket, it's gone. Um, however, um, we'll see what things will happen. Hopefully I'll be able to see one of the shows when it comes around. And of course, and you I'll can always uh, use your journalistic show. privilege and get in through the, uh, the back door, can't you? <laughs> OK, Paul, and if you do, let me know, because I'll tag along. You're watching The Arise interview, plenty more still ahead, as we continue our chat about the reunion of Genesis, one of the most successful rock bands ever. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise Interview. I'm Charles Enyagolo. Now, as you probably heard, after 13 years of silence, the hugely popular British rock band Genesis have decided to return to the stage after several factors fell into place, as they put it. Rumours had been swirling for some time about a possible Genesis reunion, reaching a crescendo in the middle of last year when two of the band's members, Phil Collins and Mike Rutherford, appeared on stage for a surprise set that included the Genesis classic, Follow You, Follow Me. But still, Mike Rutherford and Tony Banks had to wait for a break in Phil Collins' extensive solo tour promoting his own work. That break finally arrived this year, and a Genesis reunion tour is now scheduled to kick off in November. And as the world waits to see if they are still a musical force to be reckoned with, we ask, do Genesis still have what it takes to bring the house down? We'll chinwag about that in a moment, but first, here's their notable classic single from the 1970s, Follow You, Follow Me. Follow You, Follow Me. That was, of course, after Peter Gabriel, because uh, Peter Gabriel had left the band by the time they released that. I think that's from the album. Uh, and then there were three. 
And with me from our London studios, the international record producer Robert Corridge, who has remastered for some of the biggest prog rock bands ever, and the London-based journalist Paul Davis, who writes for Record Collector and Prog Magazine, as well as the Daily Express, the Sunday Express, the Times and the Independent. Gentlemen, thank you very much for staying with us. And Paul, you were mentioning, actually, when you and I were texting each other excitedly about this upcoming show, you were talking about the fact that it's uh, reunited um, three, you know, the sort of uh, three of them, uh, setting up a UK tour at the same time as Steve Hackett is playing his seconds out UK tour. So, as you said, it'll be Genesis 70s and 80s, or, or certainly 70s, versus the other Genesis of 80s and 90s. Yes, it is, you know, and, you know, Steve Hackett, as we both, you know, Robert and I have um, already stated, has been touring the exceptional back catalogue of Genesis from the 70s around the world now for quite a number of years, and very successful tours. And, you know, he is the, you know, the band leader for that essentially now, isn't he, you know, as a result. Uh, and you've got um, a massive UK tour occurring in November at the same time pretty much when uh, the, the three of Genesis, uh, the current Genesis, is playing as well. So I suppose those who can't get tickets uh, for Genesis can hopefully, you know, get the few last remaining tickets for Steve Hackett because that's where all the real Genesis fans, the ones who love the band, like the three of us, and uh, yourself included, Charles, have just been intimating, want to hear all that old material. And the only way we're going to get to hear it live anymore is by, you know, Steve Hackett's, you know, a wonderful curation of, the, of these albums and presentation. He's got a superb band as well to play with them. And don't forget that uh, Genesis themselves had to bring in a supreme guitarist in Daryl Sturmer to be able to play the complex uh, guitar arrangements of Steve Hackett, which he executed very well himself. Um, but, you know, it's going to be a bumper November, December, Christmas, Genesis time. And it's very interesting, Robert, because I think one of the things that really made them stand out initially was the fact that they, I mean that, that some of the apart from Phil Collins who I think went to a grammar school um, the rest of them went to one of the top boarding schools in the UK and in the world Charter House which is in Godalming in Surrey um, and I mean I actually have a relative who went to the same school but went before I mean obviously considerably younger than they are but they are legends at that school um, and I mean, it, 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 I think it was that that shaped the way they produced those kinds of early songs that you really like, which were brilliantly intellectual, weren't they? Yes, they were. They, were, they still are. And, and you listen to the, the lyrics and the way the songs are put together. They're just hugely enjoyable epics in, in, in most cases. So, you know, do I mind if, if Genesis the Three don't play them? Personally, I don't, because I know Steve Hackett's going to be out there doing it probably better than anybody else anyway. You, you mentioned, uh, Robert, earlier, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. That's, of course, another splendid classic. I mean, uh, I think my favourite from that era would have to be Nursery Crimes. Uh, I love things like Supper's Ready, which would go on for, for I mean, 20 minutes continuously. We're going to hear a little bit of that later on. But when you think about albums like The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, you think of songs like From a Trick of the Tail, like Squonk, for example, just absolutely phenomenal music. And, and for you particularly, Robert, because you've got the ear of a mastering engineer, you must hear things there that most other people simply can't. Pro probably at my age, Charles, not, because my ears are probably shot. But <laughs> besides that, yeah, the, if, you, if you listen to Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, and it is an epic to listen to, um, to some people it'll be an ordeal. It's, it's a very long album, but if you, if you put the time and effort into listening to it, it's just pure brilliance. And, and when they moved off into, into you know, the trick of the tale, it worked very well as well. It's, it was surprising how similar the band actually managed to keep it after Gabriel's departure. Um, and there's a lot of credit there goes to Phil Collins for sure. 
Absolutely, even though there's also a lot of criticism that goes to Phil Collins, and I'll bring you in, Paul, because there are people who say that it was his arrival that commercialized Genesis. I mean, of course, they made a heck of a lot more money, but um, they became more sort of more of a pop band than a prog rock band. What do you reckon? Yes, they came. They became a pop prog rock band in many ways, didn't they? You know, especially on record, but. You know, they've sold over 100 to 150 million albums. Not many bands can do that. And since Duke in 1980, the, f uh, the five albums uh, from Duke to We Can't Dance all went to number one. Uh, there's a plethora of top 10 number one hits as well. And when you're in a business, the record industry, and you're having massive success on something, that want that con to continue. And obviously, you know, you're playing bigger stadiums and, you know, get more and more attention. You fall into a trap in a way, uh, trying to continue that music. They have, um, on certain albums, tried to play more epic songs, the three of them. But, you know, without Steve Hackett involved, there's just no complexity there in the music, apart from Tony Banks on keyboards, to balance and um, enrich, and, you know, the blend there. But, you know, you can't knock them for their success. And there has been some great songs they've done in that period, obviously, as well as, you know, the more commercial aspect. And this is where you get two different sides of the Genesis coin where fans come in. You get a generational shift, really. People who remember the 70s and the door and love it. And people who came in on the 80s and 90s who really didn't listen to Genesis in the 70s, probably thought they were a different band completely, um, especially with the different personnel. And they, uh, you get two camps in a way. And it would be nice just to see if on this tour they can blend in some of the older material into their set that they haven't really played. And they did promise to play on the Calling All Stations album when Ray Wilson came in to replace Phil Collins, but actually didn't uh, do that in the end. So, you know, there's plenty of scope there if they just wish to entertain the fans properly, all the fans. Um, Robert, what would you say is the state of prog rock today? I mean, is it now something that people look back, you'd sort of reminisce about something that was, that was from the era of the 70s and sort of 80s and so on? And, and you know, it, it is no longer something that's being played in sort of rock music today? Oh, I think it's exactly the opposite. I think it's probably more popular today. Um, and you've got you know, fantastic uh, magazines like Prog Magazine, which is putting the, the message out there and more people have become aware of not just the old bands like Genesis, Yes and so on, but also new bands that have come out that have followed the trend and then written their own scores to, those, to that sort of message. Now I think it's stronger today than it ever has been and it wouldn't surprise me if you went and analysed the sales figures um, you know, when you take in the generation, that they're probably better today than they were in the day for some of these bands. It's very interesting you mentioned that because it's very funny how popular prog rock is. The, the person who actually turned me on to it originally was a Nigerian who was going to school in Italy when I was in the UK. And then I heard a lot more of it from a Nigerian soldier who came on a tour of the UK. Amazing, isn't it? Stay with us. want to talk to you some more, but you will let you go in a minute. I know you, you want to run off, Paul, but just hang in there with us. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we discuss the upcoming reunion tour of the brilliant British rock band Genesis. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise interview. I'm Charles Enyagulu. Now, we've been talking about the British band Genesis that's dominated the prog, rock and pop scene since the 1970s. The band have announced their much anticipated reunion after a 13 year absence. It's a 10 date tour of the UK and Ireland. As you can imagine, the news is an enormously big deal for fans of the progressive rock band and there's 
tremendous excitement about that upcoming tour, which is called The Last Domino. But as Rolling Stone magazine notes, there are still a lot of unanswered questions about that tour. For instance, given that it's called The Last Domino, is this a farewell tour? Did they invite the other two original members of the band, Peter Gabriel and Steve Hackett, who left the band more than 50 years ago? What songs are they going to play? And will they include the old classics from the 1970s? Well, whilst we ponder those questions, let's take you back to the early 1970s and tune in and turn on to this wonderfully cerebral animated classic, Supper's Ready. Sitting beside you, I look into your eyes As the sound of motor cars fades in the night time I swear I saw your face change It didn't seem quite right and it's hello babe with your guardian hair so blue cool hey my baby don't you know our love is true coming closer with our eyes a distance falls around our bodies Out in the garden The moon seems very bright Six saintly shrouded men Move across the lawn slowly The seventh walks in front With a cross held high in hand And it's Your supper's waiting for you Hey, my baby, don't you know our love is true? And uh, with me from our London studios, the international record producer Robert Corridge, who has remastered for some of the biggest prog rock bands ever. And, of course, the London-based journalist Paul Davis, who writes for Record Collector and Prog Magazine, as well as the Daily Express, the Sunday Express, the Times and the Independent. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And, of course, supper's ready. I mean, what can I say? Absolute, absolute smash classic there. But, Robert, um, do you think there's any chance at all of new music from Genesis? I mean... It's been 30-odd years since we can't dance. Well, I, actually, I hope they do do something new. I mean, although the latter Genesis was never my favourite, I think if they don't do new music, they're actually squandering a massive opportunity and um, shortchanging the fans. It would be good if they did something. It would be, it'd be an epic thing for them to try, and I think it would work, actually. And uh, Paul, um, and actually, some people have, have suggested that they only became Genesis fans from 1980 when they released their album Duke. Before that, they felt their work was too artsy and too intellectual, and most ordinary people simply didn't understand it. I mean, is that a fact from your point of view? Um, well, it, no, not really. I mean, this is where we're talking about two different camps, aren't we? I mean, at that time, and look, Peter, a lot of Peter Gabriel's lyrics at the time were influenced by the Greek myths, for example. You know, that's what he was growing up with and, you know, going to Charterhouse and that's where his head was revolving around at that time. And but also look at Supper's Ready, you know, the more transcendental, trippy kind of uh, songs as well. Then we get into The Lamb, which is a very complex, I don't think many people uh, really understood what was going on there, but that is the allure of those albums. You know, they've got a complex depth to them, lyrically and musically, which people now, prog music is on the rise, as we discussed, we know, with the success of magazines like Prog Magazine, you know, it is on the rise and um, it's becoming a new movement again. Now we go into the 80s and 90s, go more commercial after Duke, no, that's five number one albums and all those singles. Has, they brought in a completely different fan base into that. Retained some of their original authentic fan base, but it was a whole new generation. It was just a generational shift following, you know, a more stripped down membership in Genesis at that time. Um, 
whether or not they will do new music, whether or not they'll think, well, we've done all the hits, we've sold all these tickets, we could do something a little bit more authentic like we used to. Let's have a go at it, chaps. Let's see where we get to. Aren't they doing Let's hope they do. Yeah. That that would be the the wonderful you know thing that would finally you know put a seal on the 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 you know beautiful catalogue that Genesis you know have created during the seventies and partly in the eighties and nineties. We have hope. Yes, I think I'll I'll share in that hope. But Robert, let's talk a little bit about you and your work because in addition to being a record producer you also specialize in uh, as a mastering engineer who has uh, reworked catalogs and remastered for major bands such as Uriah Heep, Status Quo, Yes, Manfred Mann and, and Nazareth to mention just a few of them. I mean you're, you've also written books and lots of liner notes for many of these artists and your knowledge of the rock scene of the 60s 70s and 80s is quite simply encyclopedic i mean how did you get to do all that um i fell into it actually it was a it was a, an unusual story and um yeah, yeah I, I i really did fall into it and then found that i loved doing that type of work and i sort of stuck with it on and off over the years in recent years, I've got back into it, which is a good thing. Um, and I've got a daughter studying at Berkeley, so she's doing this stuff better than I am now, which is quite an interesting <laughs> twist to it all. Well, that's very interesting. So what are you working on at the moment, uh, Robert? I mean, because I know you've relaunched your record label, Red Steel Music, along with your production company. Um, yeah, what we've got going at the moment, we're doing some work for um, Uriah Heap on, on some digging out some old tracks and some old recordings and old live things that are being put together for their 50th anniversary, and that's being done for BMG. Um, we've got a new OCBSA album underway. We've got back catalogue of OCBSA, which of course in some veins could be classed as prog in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. We're doing reissues of a lot of um, the albums that came out in the 80s and 90s more than anything else so we've got a, a bit of a, a job on our hands there and we've got material from Walter Egan I don't know if you remember him he had a big hit with Magnet and Steel and Hot Summer Nights and I have a new album which we put together with him and that's coming out shortly um, entitled the Pamela album at the moment and um, we're not sure on the final title but all of the music is actually done already um, so yeah it's it's a lot of fun doing stuff well, I mean, that sounds absolutely brilliant. And, and let me ask you, Paul, your journalistic career has spanned writing for some of the world's biggest newspapers, including, you know, the Sunday Express, the Daily Express, the Times, the Independent, and of course, Record Collector, Prog Magazine, to mention a few. Is there an aspect of journalism that you prefer? Or are you more of a generalist? Because, I mean, you've written about virtually everything, haven't you? Well, I prefer music. I've always um, I've loved music since I, you know, can remember hearing it, basically. And um, I fell into uh, working um, for music magazines back in the day, Vox magazine and NME. I was there. Smash Hits originally is what got me into, um, you know, into um, music journalism. I went on to work for Q magazine uh, for many years as well um, after that, before I... Um, disembarked on and uh, moved over to uh, national newspapers. But I've always kept my hand in, you know, writing live reviews. That's what I like to do, is like to go out and um, so much music, especially in London, but, you know, uh, also around the world, you know, writing live reviews on bands, album reviews. Got my own website, uh, which in conjunction with Robert here, decibelreport.com, which we've been building up, um, you know, so there's a lot of content on there. But, you know, that's what keeps me going, keeps my, it keeps my, the adrenaline and the buzz going, you know, for me, you know, and uh, kind of like, you know, enables me to do other things as well. But this is my passion. We all have a passion. My passion is music and writing about music. Well, yeah. I want to it's thank you both of you very much well, indeed for sharing uh, this extraordinary day with us and for bringing your considerable experience to bear for our uh, audience out there who are listening in. Uh, Paul Davis and Robert Corridge, okay. thank you very much indeed. Well, that's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and London. 
Bye-bye and thank you for watching.